This is Shambles, a street in the city of York. Its overhanging medieval timber frame structures make it a quite popular tourist spot today. But the history of Shambles offers more than just preserved architecture and the history of the butcher's trade in the 15th and 16th centuries. It offers us the tale of the Pearl of York, the lady who defied Queen Elizabeth I's religious persecution. Welcome to Nutty History. This is the untold story of the Tudor woman that was crushed to death. Accused of harboring Jesuits, Margaret Clitheroe's trial took place at Guildhall of York, but Margaret was cemented in her convictions. She refused to be tried by the jury or acknowledge the charges against her. She boldly claimed that she has made no offense for which she should confess guilt. She even demanded that there should be no trial, as there hasn't been any offense against the law. Margaret had ulterior motives behind avoiding the trial. If she had cooperated and then been brought to trial, her children would have been used as witnesses against her. So, she chose to accept a death sentence instead. Ten fort et dure means being pressed to death. This was the legal punishment assigned to those who refused to make a plea and stand trial in Elizabethan England. On March 15, 1586, a day after her arraignment, Judge George Clinch read out her sentence. She showed no remorse towards the punishment and instead scornfully remarked, God be thanked, I am not worthy of such a good death as this. What we know of her martyrdom mostly comes from her confessor John Mush's book, Life of Margaret Clitheroe. As Father Mush was a Catholic priest himself, he couldn't risk attending court in person. Someone else had to be his eyes and ears on the streets of York and at the Lent Assize. There are few who believe that this witness was perhaps a young Guy Fawkes, the same guy who goes, Remember, remember the 5th of November, the gunpowder, treason, and plot. The Catholic Encyclopedia has detailed her martyrdom. Although she was probably with child, this horrible sentence was carried out on Lady Day 1586, or Good Friday according to New Style. She had endured an agony of fear the previous night, but she was now calm, joyous, and smiling. She walked barefoot to the toll booth on Ouse Bridge, for she had sent her hose and shoes to her daughter Anne as a token that she should follow in her steps. She had been distressed by the ministers and even now was urged to confess her crimes. No, no, Mr. Sheriff, I die for the love of my Lord Yesu, she answered. She was laid on the ground, a sharp stone beneath her back. Her hands stretched out in the form of a cross and bound to two posts. Then a door was placed upon her, which was weighted down until she succumbed to the weight. Her last words during the painful 15 minutes were, Yezu, 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 have mercy on me. During the late 1560s and 1570s, England was going through a religious upheaval. Elizabeth I, the new young queen, was trying to undo everything her elder half-sister and predecessor, Mary I, had imposed on the country during her reign, specifically Catholicism and the persecution of Protestants. So Elizabeth I was obviously contrary to Mary and reimposed Protestantism and was against Catholics. In the era when Elizabeth I made attending Protestant church service every Sunday necessary by law, many Catholics who stayed true to their faith unobtrusively would sneak off to attend illegal Catholic mass after the Protestant church service. Even though any sort of Catholic worship was deemed punishable by law, Margaret Clitheroe was an unapologetic Catholic. She didn't bother to hide her faith. Instead, she joined York's recusants. These were the dissenters who shunned the official church services and objected to swearing allegiance to the queen, an act itself enough to be prosecuted for treason. Over the next 10 years, Margaret Clitheroe got well acquainted with York's prison. At first, she was fined for not attending the church according to the 1559 injunctions which formed part of the Elizabethan settlement. Margaret's husband, a Protestant, paid her fines. For reasons unknown, John Clitheroe, or Mr. Margaret Clitheroe, had no problem with his wife being a Catholic or raising their children Catholic, despite being well aware of how this was against the law. Margaret got incarcerated first in 1577 for a repetition of the misdemeanor of defying the law for attending Protestant church service. It was noted by the parish register that Margaret at that time was with child and gave birth to her third offspring, William, in prison. Despite that, Margaret would get arrested twice more in 1580 and 1583, spending more than a year in prison on both occasions. However, in the third instance, she made good use of the time she had on her hands and learned to read and write. Her fourth arrest on March 10, 1586 was on grounds larger than failing to attend church services. 
The Council of North, the Queen's official representatives in this part of England, summoned John Clitheroe to explain the absence of his son Henry, but John claimed he had no knowledge. This led to a prompt search of the Clitheroe home, and a frightened servant revealed to authorities Margaret's biggest crime, the existence of a priest hole, a secret room where Margaret had sheltered and protected Catholic priests during the time they were being hunted down. She was arraigned four days later and charged with the crime of harboring and maintaining Jesuits and seminary priests, traitors to the Queen's Majesty and her laws. The reason for her downfall came from the desire to emulate the nobles who were known to discreetly harbor priests and aid them to stay incognito, disguised as schoolmasters or music teachers for the house's children. The nobles had the space, finances, and means to support and conceal priests. The Clitheroe House, on the other hand, was not able to do it in the middling sort of household on the bustling shambles in York as efficiently as required. Today, that house, 3536 Shambles, serves as her shrine. Nearly 20 years before Margaret Clitheroe, formerly Middleton, was born, Henry VIII was ruling as the second Tudor King of England. In his stubbornness to divorce his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, who, by the way, failed to give him a male heir, Henry VIII defied the Pope and set up the Church of England. This started a religious civil war between Catholics and the new church's Protestants. After Henry VIII's male successor, Edward, died young and childless, his elder daughter, Mary, inherited the royal crown of England. During Mary's rule, reforms and restrictions were aimed at restoring the Catholic Church's ascendancy in England. Most controversially, she ordered 280 Protestants torched at the stake as heretics, a fact that would later cement her reputation as Bloody Mary. Mary's successor, Elizabeth I, torched five Anabaptists at the stake during her 45-year reign, ordered the deaths of around 800 Catholic rebels implicated in Northern Earl's Revolt of 1569, and had at least 183 Catholics, the majority of whom were Jesuit missionaries, quartered as traitors. They say every story is like a coin and has two sides. The same goes for the story of Margaret, the Pearl of York. During the 1580s, there was a major three-way power struggle underway behind the scenes in York. The first party was the Council of the North, which, as we explained earlier, was the Queen's official representative in this part of England. The second party was York's City Council, led by a Lord Mayor. And the third party was the Church of England, headed locally by the Archbishop of York. All of these three vied for the Queen's favor, and they knew the best way to earn it was to persecute Catholics. But there is a twist in this story. The then Lord Mayor of York was Henry May stepfather of Margaret, who was elected not even a month before Margaret's arrest for harboring Jesuits. It was a scandal. The representatives of the Council of the North must have been rubbing their hands together to get a win over the city council. Both parties then, as well as the church, had motive enough to investigate Margaret further. When whispers went around that she might be hiding priests and allowing mass to be said in her house, which body would have acted first? We already know that it was the Council of the North that summoned John, but it was the city council that raided the Clitheroe residence. Opinions on Margaret Clitheroe have varied throughout history. Many of her contemporaries deemed her to be mad, while Henry May, Lord Mayor of York, and Margaret's stepfather claimed that Margaret had taken her own life. Somewhat unusually, Elizabeth I herself seemed to condemn the punishment of Margaret, writing a letter to the people of York which stated that Margaret should have been spared the terrible fate on account of her gender alone or her possible pregnancy. In more recent history, Margaret has been revered rather than condemned, being canonized by Pope Paul VI in October of 1970 as one of 40 English martyrs. It was also Pope Paul VI who first called Margaret the Pearl of York. Would you like for us to cover more personalities like her from the Nutty Archives of History? Tell us in the comments. Also, do not forget to like, share, and subscribe for more Nutty History videos.